Good morning, everyone. A warm welcome to each one of you. It's good to have you join us again for service. Let's commit this time to God in prayer before we hear the preaching of the word. Dear Lord, we want to thank you for your presence, and we do want to make room, Lord, for you to do as you please in our hearts. We pray that even as we look at the subject of authority, that we will be able to understand, Lord, and submit ourselves to your authority, to know who you are, to know what you can do, and to know your heart. We pray that your word will bring light and hope into our hearts. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So today we're going to continue in our series in the book of Revelation. And the sermon title is The Authority of Christ. Uh, the scripture text is taken from Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. So this is the sixth church we are looking at. And uh, let me read the scripture text to you. So this is Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 till 13. To the angel of the church of Philadelphia, write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God, and I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So we find here uh, Jesus speaking to the church of Philadelphia, and as I've mentioned, uh, the church of Philadelphia and the church of uh, Smyrna gets the glowing uh, commands from Jesus Christ. Okay, This church is in good shape and it's faithful to the call and what Jesus Christ is doing uh, within the church in a time of challenges and persecution. And so today we're going to do a few things. We are going to look at the subject of authority, but we're also going to understand how to uh, read and interpret uh, the language of the book of Revelation. In fact, um, there are some things here that eventually I was thinking of having an uh, uh, extra session after the service because there are some technical stuff that we need to cover in regards of uh, the coming of Christ, when and how different uh, people look at it differently and why they look at it in such a way. So the one thing we're going to look at is how uh, the New Testament, when Jesus speaks, he, there's a lot of reference to the Old Testament and we have been looking at that. And this is a very important part for us to understand simply because there, it, it brings us uh, to understand that the, in the Bible there is continuity between the Old and the New. You find that there's not so great a difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, what God spoke in the Old Testament, He brings to completion in the New Testament. So one phrase here we see about Jesus speaking about His authority, and uh, you find that in this verse, uh, he, he says that He holds the key of David, and there we see the continuity that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of David, and He is the chosen king whose kingdom will not come to an end, okay? So it says this very clearly. Uh, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who hold the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds, so I've placed before you an open door that no one can shut. And you find that this verse is also a quotation from the Old Testament. You find in Isaiah chapter 22, verses 20 to 24, 
uh, this is what God says to uh, Eliakim, okay? And you find that during the time of Isaiah, in fact, we, we heard about it uh, during our prayer meeting, uh, the people turned away from God and there were a lot of uh, leaders who have uh, absconded their responsibility, who have led the people into idolatrous, idolatrous worship. And so God looks for a faithful leader and this is what he says to Eliakim, okay? In that day, I will summon my servant Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, I will clothe him with your robe and fasten your sash around him and hand your authority over to him. He will be a father to those who live in Jerusalem and to the people of Judah. I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I will drive him like a peg into a firm place. He will become a seat of honour for the house of his father. All the glory of his family will hang on him its offspring and offshoots, all its lesser vessels, from the bowls to all the jars. So again, there is a quotation, okay? What he opened, um, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. And, God, and this is God conferring his authority, the authority that is fully seen in Christ upon Eliakim. And in this passage, we begin to see uh, how God speaks of authority, Okay? Um, you know, in keeping things the way it should be, in opening doors which no one else can shut. And uh, it's described in the image of a peg, okay? Uh, you know, uh, God makes a comparison with good leaders and bad leaders. Uh, the bad leaders are pegs that cannot hold on the wall. Uh, you know, when you put a lot of things, it falls off. But here you find that with the authority of God, once he's stuck to the wall, you know, everything hinges, hangs on this peg, okay? And such is the authority that God confers upon an individual. And also what I want you to mark is the continuity in the language, the God who speaks to the old, to the new, and is faithful to fulfill the promises spoken in the old, in the new, okay? You see that, or what Jesus, uh, God spoke to Israel, he's speaking to the church. Another verse that quotes the Old Testament, in fact, there are several Old Testament verses that speaks of this, okay, is from verse 9. I will make those who are the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you, okay? And this is again from Isaiah 60, verse 14. The children of your oppressors will come bowing before you, and all who despise you will bow down at your feet, and will call you the city of the Lord, Zion of the, Ho the Holy One of Israel. And, and you see all these references in the passage that we read, the, the city of God, the name, and uh, those who oppose, who accuse the faithful coming to a place where they realize that the faithful are called by God and loved by God. And again, this is a story of continuity. What God spoke to Israel, God speaks to the church of Philadelphia, to the church who are mainly made out of Gentiles. Okay? So God is doing something. And, and what um, we have to be uh, cautious as we interpret this, and we'll be looking at this more as we, we, we study further this book, is uh, how you want to understand the relationship between Israel and the church. And, and I'm, I'm pretty sure you all are exposed to a lot of teachings that speak about Israel being a separate uh, entity by itself, uh, where there is no continuity between uh, Israel and the church. So uh, there's a lot of teachings you know, on that manner. There are some teachings that emphasize uh, following uh, the feast and so forth. And um, they would... Uh, literal, have a literal uh, interpretation of the Bible and says that God will establish Israel again and Jerusalem and so forth. Okay? So there is that kind of thinking which falls under the category of dispensationalism. And then there is covenant theology okay, where there it speaks there's a continuity between the church. Okay? And therefore, the church is not the replacement of Israel, but rather the fruition of the promises of God to Abraham. So what you see here is that whatever God has said to Abraham, I will make you great, I will bless all nations through you, you find that all those pro promises 
I mean, those promises has to do with the identity of Israel, the kind of nation it will be. And all those promises are fully uh, realized in the church, okay? Uh, the coming of the Pentecost, you know, all nations, you know, the tongues, uh, the uh, Holy Spirit came out and speakers, people spoke in different tongues, and then the church moved out of Jerusalem to all nations. So you will see that fulfillment, okay? And uh, I, I'm just dropping this here, okay, because we're going to look at it further and develop our understanding as we go. But this is something that you should think about, okay? And uh, you should re realize that how beautiful Scriptures is. When you keep reading it as a whole, uh, the message is so rich, uh, so in-depth, and it really helps us to think about life and God and his ways in a very nuanced, rich, developed way, rather than thinking of it in a very superficial and uh, light way. So this is, is something that uh, you should believe when you think about scriptures. So now we come to the subject of authority, okay? And here you find there's a definition um, taken from the Illustrated Bible Dictionary, okay? The power or right to do something particularly, to give orders and to see that they are followed. The word authority, as used in the Bible, usually means a person's right to do certain things because of the position or office held by that person. This word emphasizes the legality and right more than the physical strength needed to do something. Okay. So it's making a distinction between power and authority, okay? So power is the strength and ability to do, but authority is the legal right to do it. So you can see as a pol police officer, when you're driving, if you see uh, a policeman say stop, you will stop, okay? And you are not stopping because you're afraid of that one person. You're stopping because of the authority conferred on that person by the government, okay? And then there is the court. The judge, you know, he makes a judgment and he is given authority uh, to proclaim that judgment, okay? And there's a different kind of authority, the, the, the doctors. Okay? So when you are sick, um, you go and see a doctor. And if you're very sick, the doctor will tell you, okay, there's something wrong with you, you have to take this medication, you have to start taking care of yourselves, and he tells you what to do. And those words has authority because of his learning, because of his, ex his experience, his uh, ability to diagnose your illness and to provide a way for you to get better. So if you ignore all these forms of authority, you're bound to get into a lot of trouble, okay? Whether if, you're, if, you, if you ignore a police officer, you're going to be thrown in jail, okay? Of course, you, I, I don't think many of us meet judges. But if you ignore the doctor's advice, which some of us are prone to do, you can get into a lot of trouble. Okay? It just depends how you view the whole subject of authority. And, and this is a very difficult subject, um, which we will talk about more. So what you see clearly, you know, the person who is conferred with the most authority, the person who has all power and glory and has every right to do everything, is Jesus Christ. Okay? And the authority of Jesus Christ is the King of kings and Lord of lords. So there's no governance, no power, no principality that is above the name of Jesus. And Jesus proclaims it when he gives the great commission. When he sends out his disciples, he says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Okay? So what it means is that he will decide you know, who he will bestow authority upon. And what it means that he will have the final say in everything in life, you know. And that's why he's known as the Alpha and Omega and the God who brings judgment. That means everything he says goes. You know, he has that supreme power and authority over all things. And you find that this is something quite difficult to chew on in its totality, okay. Uh, this has been a problem then and it has been a problem now you find that the Pharisees and Sadducees often would question the authority of Jesus Christ. They were wondering, what gives this guy the right to say and make the claims that he does? So the Pharisees questioned Jesus about the source of his authority, considering he had no official training, okay? 
He was not trained in any of their schools. He hailed from Galilee, a place unknown for religious instruction. So Galilee is not a place of learning, a place of great people. It, was, uh, it had a reputation for people who are not learned and, uh, you know, and backward. Okay? So that's definitely not there in the books. And furthermore, he had never studied under any rabbi. Hence, they questioned the legitimacy of his right to say and do the things he was doing. Okay? So that's, we should ask ourselves, why do we accept the authority of Jesus Christ? Why, you know, and, and what are the quali- qualifications you know, would we set to approve a source of authority as legitimate okay? when it comes to God, when it comes to His Word? So in spite of it being clear that Jesus had authority from the Father through what He did, the miracles, the words, and, 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 and everything about Him spoke of that authority. He, he, he could speak of the Word of God, his, the revelation and the things He did. He could bring the dead back to life. Clearly attested to the authority of Christ over all things, but they found it hard to believe. And I think that's the same struggle we experience as people. You know, do we fully accept the authority of Christ? And if we do, what would that mean to, for us? You know, how would it change the way we think and do our life? Okay? So I've put out a list of uh, questions of how the implications of the authority of Jesus. And some people will ask, who gave Jesus the right to tell me how I should live? Okay? Who gave Jesus the right to judge all things? Or who gave Jesus the authority to forgive, heal, and raise the dead? Should we have a say in how Jesus must rule over us? You know, is it safe to proclaim that He has absolute authority? Maybe we should advise Him, or maybe we should know better. And, and there's a lot of people who say that, and, and a lot of people who criticize the Old Testament and segments of the Bible saying that this is not acceptable, okay? And this cannot be the Word of God because they feel they know better. And so by what authority do we have a right to question? And people say, yes, you know, perhaps we are more learned now than the people who wrote the Bible. We have science on our side. We have accumulated much more wisdom and and experience as to scrutinize what the Bible says and make decisions for ourselves what really works and what doesn't. Or perhaps we have a proven track of record uh, of success. We have accomplished so many things, and therefore we should be an authority over our own lives. Okay? And in the present age, there is this very, uh, you know, people are very picky about their freedom. And so if you say authority, then that means no freedom. It's always authority versus freedom, and people don't like, the, the current age don't like to have anyone tell them what they should do and what they cannot do, okay? They want to be an authority to themselves. So you have all this happening, I mean, and of course, uh, you can see the dynamics at home. You raise children, you think about authority, you think about how your parents raised you and how the whole authority card is being played there. And we all have different experiences concerning that. And that is one of the reasons why we are a little bit careful or scared about who we give authority and how uh, that takes place, okay? And so, how can we uh, work this out in our life? You know, how should we think about it? Uh, what should happen? And, and you find that Jesus gives us an example about a person who understood authority and entrusted Jesus with all the authority. And this is the story about the Roman centurion. Okay? Uh, he's a, not a Jew, he's not an Israelite, and he comes. And, and this is uh, what happens. Okay? So I'll read these text. It's taken from Matthew chapter 8, verses 7 to 12. Jesus said to him, Shall I come and heal him? So the Roman centurion had a servant who was ill, and, and he, he, he uh, uh, went to Jesus and asked, for Jesus to heal him. So Jesus said, okay, I'll come with you and heal. And then the centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. And that one, come, and he comes. And then he gives another illustration of the same. 
And when Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take the place at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay? So it's a very powerful illustration of how authority looks like and, and what it works. Here comes a, a soldier and the, you know, people in the military know a lot about authority. Uh, the ranks speak of the authority they carry, the number of soldiers they command, and a centurion will command uh, 100 soldiers. And, and um, when he says, do this, that person will do it. And he, when he looked at Jesus, he, he just believed that whatever Jesus says goes right. In his eyes, there was no limit to the authority of Christ. There was no need for Jesus to take a walk with him and come home and you know, touch the servant and do all the things and, and, and do you know, all this uh, to have the servant's life change. Okay? All Jesus had to say is say the word. You say heal, he'll be healed. If you want to heal my servant, you just say it and that will happen. And can we see Jesus uh, th through the same eyes of the centurion? Can we believe that at the end of the day, when it comes to my life, whatever Jesus says, actually, that, that will go. Right? That will happen. If he says he wants to bless, there will be a blessing. If he says that we can change, then we will change. If he says, let there be joy, then there will be joy. And, and we know it's kind of challenging to have that kind of faith in God. But at the same time, it is also the only way to look at God. If we call Him God, then there is no limit to His authority. You know, He is in control and He has all things uh, in His hands. And if we were to put it uh, you know, apply it in our own life, then the place that God speaks is through the Word. So the second question we will have to ask ourselves is do we believe in the authority of God's Word? Is it really God's Word or is it 50-50, 80-20? You know, should I believe everything or should I just take the things I like? Or how does this happen? And you find that the Bible is very clear about its completeness, its authority as the Word of God. And here it says the, the biblical text is authoritative and declares the truth on every subject it addresses. Okay? When understood correctly, it nurtures our relationship with God and others, shaping our hearts and minds to conform to the image of Christ. That is the authority of Scriptures. So the Bible is God's Word, and therefore we accept its authority over our lives because it's God's breath. In 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. All Scripture is God's breath and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So do we accept the authority of Scriptures? And that list there, teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And therefore, we allow the Word of God to, to do these very things in our life, to teach us, to rebuke us, to correct us, and train us in the things of God. Do we see the Word in the light of its authority, its ability to make us conform to the image of Christ, or do we question uh, this authority in our life? And, and that's the, 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 the challenge of this day. And, and there's a lot of voices around us that tells us, hey, don't get too hung up with the Bible. And most of us find it difficult to sit down and read the Bible, okay? And... Um, I mean, if I reflect on my own excuses, well, if I don't read, life goes on, and I know what to do. I have enough authority on the subject of life and how to handle my life and how to make my own decisions, and therefore, why should I sit down and submit myself entirely to the authority of God? That would be the case, you know. But as life goes on, you understand through all your experiences that actually 
your authority doesn't take you far at all. In fact, you have no control over your life. And many times, you know, we, we jump on something and we run with it. Then when it starts to uh, spiral downwards, then we wonder what is happening here. You know, where is the authority? What's going on? And how it is. So that is a challenge. So let's go back to the text and see how Jesus speaks to the church of Philadelphia. So here is the conversation. Jesus says, I know your deeds. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. And Jesus goes on to say, see, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. Okay. And you find that Jesus gives these following promises uh, to the church as to how we understand the open door. You know, the first thing he says about being his people, you know, you will have the power to be my people. You will be called by my name, okay? And then the people whom you are witnessing to. So there are a bunch of Jews there. They were giving the Christians a hard time. Same like, the same way they gave Jesus a hard time. And here Jesus is saying, they will come and acknowledge that I am your Lord and I love you and I've set you apart and they will come into salvation. Okay? And then there's the hour of trial and Jesus says, don't worry, you know, when it comes, I will keep you through it. You know, my grace will be with you. And they were trusting the Lord to see him through his word. So these are amazing promises that Jesus says to the church and he would carry it through and he would carry the church through when they were feeling particularly weak, okay, and they were persecuted. So let's, let's again think about the questions here, you know. What are the quali qualifications would you set to approve a source of authority as legitimate? So if you are the church of Philadelphia, or in our church, what, what should we be looking at? Should we be thinking, you know, the only way we can get out of this jam is we have a whole bunch of talented and gifted people. Or people with a lot of accolades, that means recognition and rewards. Oh, they have, they have connections, they have received. Or people with a lot of success and wealth and knowledge. Perhaps if we gather all these minds together, you know, they will help us to grow this church or to do amazing things, or they will help me live better lives. And, and many of us do it. I mean, we do confess, we, we kind of name these things as, as, to our, uh, as to legitimize our authority. Oh, I know this, I've learned this, I've achieved this, I've got this kind of connection, this kind of people, and so forth. Okay? And then when you start to think that way, uh, then there's a problem that comes with it. When you compare yourself with other people, it can be quite frightening, quite intimidating. You know, who has greater power, who has greater learning, who has greater experience, who has greater resources. And the whole authority game gets tossed back and forth of us being unsure. And in the midst of all this, there's a bunch of us who think, you know, we have nothing to offer. We don't have any gifts. We don't have any resources. We don't have great learning. Therefore, God cannot use us. We have no authority to say or represent God or do anything right because we have not much on our sides. But remember how Jesus speaks to the churches. You know, Philadelphia had little strength. But Jesus says, I give you authority. And I say these promises to you. And because I say, you will stand firm. Smyrna was afflicted and suffered poverty, the other church. They were suffering church. They were poor. They were facing so much persecution. But Jesus said, you are rich and I am with you. So how does this authority work you know, in our lives? How do we understand it? How, how it works through? And that's the amazing thing about God uh, and His authority. And this is something that... You know, it's a very important lesson that I had to learn in life. You see, the, the, the problem is, is when 
we don't recognize any form of authority in, in our hearts, in our lives, or we don't recognize God as a real form of authority, we just start doing things impulsively. We jump on this wagon, we do this, we do that, and we keep doing things. And many times I find myself on that track, and it's so tiring. It's so exhausting. You do this, then it doesn't work. You try this, you try that, you pretend this works, you jump. But it is all going out of control, and there's no clarity. And there isn't the joy of having uh, someone who loves you and cares for you watch over you. I mean, that's the authority of being over a father who loves you. His resources, his love, his there is to look out for you, to bless you and keep you. And so that joy escaped me when I was not clear about the whole subject of authority. But the more God challenged me to have faith in Him, the more easy I found it to do things. Because I, I, I began to realize that when God asked me to do something, it is not based on what I can do. I know I clearly cannot do it. It's not based on what I have but rather it's based on the authority of His Word who calls me. And we see this kind of conversations throughout the Bible. And one well-known conversation is between God and Moses. And when Moses ran away from Egypt and he was sitting there, you know, minding his herd, and God said to him, go and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And Moses was, me, what, who, when, how? I am nobody, I am one man. You know who Pharaoh is. He has authority over the entire nation. And I have no right to tell this man, let my people go. And to add on to that, I don't speak too well. You know, I stammer a lot. So I don't have any power and I even can't communicate well. Come on. No way I can do this. And as a pastor, I mean, I've, I've given my own whole set of excuses to God. I've received a whole set of excuses from all of you and so many people and they're saying why they cannot do the thing that God has asked them to do. Okay? But you find that the argument is always this way. When God asks me to do something, He's expecting me to do it with my strength, with my abilities, with my uh, uh, resources. And that's where the problem lies. Because when God asks you to do something, uh, he would say, you just go with the strength you have, I'll take care of the rest of it. And I'll do that. And there's many places we are very uh, picky. I think one place where I had to really also figure out, figure out how to understand authority is my role as a parent. Uh, that's one thing. Okay? And we know in our culture, perhaps in, in many cases, authority has been misused or... Uh, authority was used to abuse people, okay? And we have to get it right, what it means, uh, you know, to have that. And until I, I came to a place and said, God, I just need to be under your authority, your love, your care. Only then I could make sense of my role as a father. Because the way God practices authority you know, he's absolutely in control, all-powerful, he's holy, he's right. But as the story of the prodigal tells us and the story of Jesus Christ tells us, he's very, very loving in the way he approaches us. And so there's so much beauty in his being under his authority. It's safe. It's a safe place, you know, to come under the authority of his promises, of his word, of his calling, because his heart is good towards us. So that's the thing. Uh, you know, being under the authority of God is the best thing that can happen to us. It's the most beautiful thing. It's the time of surrender, of letting go, of knowing, yes, on our own, you know, everything we have amounts to nothing. Like Paul says, I consider all my qualifications done as compared to the grace that God has offered me. And Paul would say, even I'm, I'm, I have a thorn on my side and even I'm weak, I know I am sustained by the Word of God and kept by His Word. And that's the, the beauty that I, 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 I see. I mean, when, when you are ministering as a pastor, there are very difficult circumstances that you go through. 
uh, you, you have to minister to, and, and some of, one of it is, is when people uh, have an illness that will take their life, perhaps like cancer, uh, they're going through in a fourth stage of cancer, or someone has lost a child or someone close to them. And you know, uh, by experience, there's nothing you can say, uh, you know, you, I mean, you can be thoughtful in your response, you should be thoughtful in your response, but you don't have the power to hold that person's heart. You just play your part, you, you be there, but you, you don't have the power to, to tell them, okay, you, you, God, I mean, you will, you will see this true right? But in all those moments uh, when I felt totally helpless as to find the words and to find the conviction to, to speak comfort into your lives, God would put his hand on my shoulder and tell me, I've got them, I love them, and in this situation, I will keep them. And that's all I need to know. And that's what I see unfold in the lives of those people in those very difficult circumstances. They are just held by the supernatural power of God. You know, uh, challenging marriages, difficult situations, you know, loss of job or whatever it is. But when the person comes to that place and submits to the authority of God, they are not held, you know, by a, a promise of cure, a promise of riches, a promise of uh, wealth and health and prosperity, but they are held by the promise of a God who they know loves them deeply and affectionately. And that's how we should accept authority. And so you can see when Jesus speaks these words into the church, uh, he, they, he speaks to them as, his, as their shepherd, the one who loves them. And he says, you know, even though you're weak, okay, I will see you through. I will carry you through in this most difficult time. And then you find that Jesus uh, speaks uh, the promises over the church, that they will receive a crown, they become a pillar, and they'll bear the name of Jesus Christ and the name of the city. Okay? So, what is happening here? All right, you find that in the beginning of the Bible, you know, Adam and Eve had all authority. They sold it. They traded it. They, they wanted to be like God. And so they came out of God's umbrella and they rebelled against Him. And they were exiled. And so God worked a way to bring them back into His safety. And that way is through Jesus Christ and the gospel. And you find that when Jesus holds authority, you know, there's a connection of, of, of his, his Lordship and how He treats us. And He crowns us, those who are faithful, those who hold on to His name. And those who hold on to His word and understand that that word is the solid ground, is the pillar, is, the, is not moving sand, but the solid ground that can withstand every storm. When they receive that word, they themselves become pillars of God's work, of God's temple, of God's glory and goodness. Okay? And again, we look at the next one. You know, those who bear the name of Jesus, who proclaim His name, who live for His name, who will not deny His name in the midst of difficulty and persecution, who was not who are not ashamed of the name of Jesus, they will bear His new name, and the name of His city will be upon them. They are the citizens of God, God's city, and they have and, and enjoy such authority. And the whole thing is that patient endurance, believing that at the end of it, you know, these promises will take place and we all will find ourselves with the crown that Jesus confers upon us, being called to be part of God's uh, majestic work in the future and bear His name in our hearts. This is what God will do. And do we live for such things? Do we look to God? Okay. So you find that these promises are all over 
the scriptures. Uh, in uh, Ephesians 2, 6 and 7, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages He might show the incomparable riches and grace expressed in His kindness to us in Christ Jesus. So you see the wordings itself, you know, this whole thing is an act of kindness, of grace, of, of His goodness. Okay, authority works in that. And then in uh, 1 Peter 3.22, Jesus Christ who has gone into the heaven and it is God's right hand with angels, authorities, powers in submission to Him. Again, it speaks about the place of Jesus. And in Revelation 2.26-27, this is what He says to the church of Thyatira. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. The one will rule them with an iron sceptre and will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my Father. Eventually, you know, we will have ultimate authority over all evil, all works of the enemies will be vanquished and we will dwell in the house of God. So, you... Ah, uh, sorry. So, let's think about this. I mean, those of us who attended the church camp, we spoke much about Dulos discipleship, servanthood discipleship. And you find that uh, Bijoy, you know, he... he he pointed at the whole subject of what it means like to be in, under the authority of Jesus Christ. I think that is something we have to really consider. I would like you to picture it like this umbrella, okay? uh, like this place of safety, of love, of kindness. It's a place of rest simply because, you know, when we try to grab authority with our own hands, when we toil, when we fight, when we try to control, when we try to enjoy life and do what we like, we, we are not in a place of rest. We are in a place of challenge and difficulty. But God wants us to be in a place of rest. You know? And even in difficult times, God wants us to know that He's got us, that He will see us through, that His grace is sufficient, that His Word will carry us through. And that's the thing. Every time things don't work my way, you know, my hands get fidgety, I want to do this, do that, and try to sort things out so things will seem better for me. But God would invite me and say, pray, listen, hear. Don't take things into your own hands. And trust it into my hands. Learn how to understand that even though seems, things don't seem good, my love remains with you. I love you with everlasting love, and I will see you. So church, whose name are we representing? Who is the source of our authority? In Colossians 3, 17, And whatever you do or say, do it as representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through Him to God the Father. Is our life given to His authority? Or are we carrying it on our own? I just invite you to stand as we look to God. Um, spend some time reflecting on what has been shared.